Greetings in the Lord. It's always a joy to have this time with you. It's special for me and for Luke and for Kimberly. Uh, I always, uh, it's, an, it's a privilege for me to welcome in the uh, Wisdom Warriors, as I have said, and I, I will never tire of it. You are precious to me and uh, you are precious to the Lord. Uh, for those that are members of the National War Council, we are very thankful. And I know that you pray and so many others around the, the, this nation and ar around the world. We are honored by that and we're very grateful. Today is like any other time. If you're looking for a 45 minute sermon that you can listen to and feel good for a few minutes and go home, that's, that's not me. You, you may want to um, follow someone else or some other type of program that and they do different things. Uh, I share when the Lord allows me the prophetic word, uh, visions and uh, teachings. And as I've said, I, I've had visions and, and prophetic words all my life, but I really enjoy teaching. And I had debated today, but you know, I'm always transparent with you and uh, believe that with Luke and, and Kimberly, they'll tell you I'm the same here as I am at home as I am anywhere else. So I, I try to be just the same person. So I'm pretty transparent in, in all that I do, the things that I can share, and then there are some that I, I don't. But I was debating on, on how to share this today. And, and, I, and I, I'm just gonna do the way I, I do at night with Luke or Kimberly when they ask me what my previous night was in my private time. We have a nightly devotion with the three of us. And before we go into our prayers, they'll usually ask, you know, did the Lord, what did he talk to you about last night? And I will share what I can with them. And, and they know now after so many years that there are things I can't share. And when I do share, I'm going to same way today with you. I'll, I'll share those things and then put together a teaching for them and then teach them. And so I have been, sharing teachings with them for many years, uh, many of which I have not shared publicly. So today, be sure to have your pen, pencil, or if you're typing on some type of iPad or computer, and have something to write on. There, there are a lot of scriptures today, and I, I will go through that and um, honor the Lord with the scriptures and know that there is a, a scriptural foundation for what he asked me to share. So I'll get started and I want to show you one other. I, I love these when they come in. Uh, we have uh, so many that send us pictures and, and other things. Uh, this is <laughs> my pictures <laughs> again. This is a, a picture of a, an eagle that Terry G had sent to us and, and I'm very thankful they know that I, uh, most of you know that I love eagles and you know, eagle is a sign of the prophetic, and I'm called to the eagle as a prophet to America. So it's it's very special. And I know that on the cherubim, if you know that, you know, one of the heads is, is that of an eagle, uh, uh, signifying the prophetic of Jesus in the, in the book of John. So thank you, uh, Terry, for sending that. I'm going to get through all my papers and sticky notes. <laughs> You remember uh, the last time on part three with the green bottle, I had shared this with you. And I think it got straight on part one, part two, and part three. You can go to my YouTube channel, Jim Stock. Uh, yeah, it's probably under Jim Stock still. And you can see, I think we have, I don't know how many postings of videos and the National War Council under the member section, I've, I've asked Greg to post, I think about 17 videos since we uh, went on our own uh, in June. So, uh, but the Lord, when he was, he, he, he visits me at night and I'm, I don't understand, I'm very thankful and I'm humbled by it. And I'm so cautious to uh, even speak in his name or, or you know, I, I he, Seems like it should be someone else, but he said, I want to talk to you about 
the prophetic word that I gave to you in the vision, and then he went further into it. And you will, this is the uh, prophetic word, and I'll highlight the three things that he spoke to me that night. And I'm going to show you or teach you the way he does me. And that's where I get these from when he visits and, you know, it's in the spirit. And, and there are, I don't know how many times I, I've seen him in the natural. And uh, I know, you know, his eyes, and his, his, his smile and his eyes crinkle a little bit. And he has an amazing laugh. But the age of Aquarius he said, is a false religion, and some have written and said, I, I thought that was just a belief. Uh, those things that are contrary to Scripture and those things that are contrary to the Lord in, in this context, they're religions, and you'll see more and more of that, and that's what the Lord is, has said, because this is the one world order, and I won't show you all those things from Aquarius, but that, um, you know, that pyramid and that all-seeing eye thing, uh, this is what they're looking at, their age of Aquarius, and uh, they're trying to substitute. And I told you that about Satan, how he takes something uh, of God and pollutes it and changes it. Um, he's a, a forger, and he, he's a counterfeit. And so he takes that which is good and counterfeits it to evil. So he's doing that with uh, the thousand-year reign uh, of the Lord, and we'll talk about that probably in part two. Uh, but this one was, um, he, he wanted to go back, and, and I will today cover, it says that earthquakes shake the earth, though earthquakes shake the earth, and the, and the seas roar with turmoil. Well, the seas uh, in the green bottle was the water that it came upon, but most of the time in Scripture, seas is a... Um, parable for the nations of the world. And so he was talking about the nations of the world and he had shown me, and I didn't put that in here of different earthquakes uh, that would cause tsunamis and volcanoes that would be erupting um, in different uh, places uh, around the world. So he said that in the nations that the earth would shake and, and, and the seas would roar uh, in, in turmoil and he said that in another part, preparing to meet my bride, saith the Lord. And he's always in, in these, not always, but when he does tell me, he says, you know, be sure to be as, as the wise, uh, the five virgins that were wise and had uh, enough oil and they trimmed their wicks. But he has never said that I'm preparing to meet my bride. And this lets me know the nearness of the time. And in part two, I'll talk about Ezra and Nehemiah and where he took me and started teaching me on that. So today I, I want to, uh, this is the lead in for it. The millennial Christ rule on earth. And the scripture is Isaiah 65, 17 for my Bereans. If you won't move on my pillow, there you go. Um, Isaiah 65, 17 for the Bereans. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So this is him prophetically talking, and we'll talk a little bit about that when I go to Matthew today. So in order to talk about this, this is how the Lord progresses and teaches me. He first, when he wanted to talk about the end times, he went back to the parable of the fig tree. And instead of going right to the parable, um, he gave me a little background on the fig tree and the sim symbolic meaning of it. And there were some that I, I had no idea about. And so I'll share this with you. Fig trees, uh, the ficus, and I'll spell it, <laughs> you know, how it's like the ficus, C-A-R-I-C-A, -A, whatever tree that is. They grow well in areas that provide eight hours of daily sunlight in moderate winters. Fruiting fig trees have a long juvenile period compared to other fruit trees. I want you to understand that the symbolism that is even in these things, it says that a, a young tree, a juvenile, has a long period before it produces fruit. And I know that the disciples were new in the Lord and had only walked with him a short period, and then they went into their ministry. 
but I was, I kind of chuckled at Luke when he was, uh, he just turned 21 uh, this, this, this September. And he said, daddy, I only have uh, six years to go. And he knew that it, you know, I had told him, I said, son, I always wait, you know, even in my own life, uh, I've walked with the Lord officially for 45 years, but I actually had a call since I was a child, saw things even then, but I was filled with the Holy Spirit in uh, 76. But in my life, I, I was uh, a different person then and uh, prophetically and I thought I was humble, but I, I really wasn't humble. But I look back and, and I, I thought that after 20 years, I had gained some type of insight and wisdom. And, and since then, it's been a, a, a long journey, put it that way. And so when I saw this about fruit trees, and it takes a, a long time for them to bear fruit, especially the juveniles, it says most, most figs will not produce a crop for the first four to five years. And I, I, that was interesting. The first harvest of figs is called the, and I'll spell, <laughs> spell this. This is from the Hebrews. B-R-E-B-A. I had no idea what that was. A bariba crop. And in Hebrew, it's, it's called a poor man's fruit. And it usually occurs in, in May or early June. And that's, keep that in mind as we progress through the teaching that the two different times the, the early uh, fruits and then the, the late fruits that are in autumn. Uh, sometimes these early Bariba fruits are inedible. So, or they may have a poor flavor. They're frequently small, acidic and inferior in texture, but may be useful for preserv uh, jams and jellies and things like that. So it's interesting if you think of that and, and pray over it. So once a fig tree reaches maturity, and Luke said it's when he's 20 years in the Lord, uh, he's well on his way, and he knows he, he's a scholar, both at ORU and in his studies of the, of, of the Word. Can't tell you how many times he's read the Bible. It can be expected to produce fruit once or, or twice per year and can continue to fruit for decades, and I'll show you some uh, examples of that. The second harvest of figs usually occurs in late September or early November. In Israel, it's usually October and November. So that's the, the fall. This late crop of figs ripens on the current year's branches. So that early one is off of last year's branches and this new one is off of this year's branches. In some tropical locations, fig trees may bear some fruit throughout the year uh, with increased production in early summer and midwinter. You may also have problems with figs if you over prune them. So <laughs> during the winter or if you, in, if you prune improperly. So if you think of that, if, if you over prune, uh, and, and I'm just, for me, I, I grew up in, in a church that um, I called him uh, Uncle Roy, uh, Brother Roy Stockstill. And it was a Baptist church and that's where as a toddler on, but I remember it was every Sunday we got roasted over the fire and, you know, we were told that if, if we didn't walk right, we were going to go to hell. And that just happens to be, you know, the Baptist part that he, you know, he taught until he got the Holy spirit and um, changed and, and went and formed a whole different church. That's a, another whole story. But if you over prune them is, and, and I look at that as the Lord disciplines us, but he doesn't over discipline us. He doesn't over correct us. So when I looked at the fig trees, which you'll see is, is symbolic of the nations, uh, the Gentiles, it says, do not over prune or even if you prune improperly. I, I look at that as being critical. And, and many people ask me about different ministries and uh, pr prophets and others. And uh, I don't, uh, that's not, you know, I have my personal opinion and I have personal knowledge of things, but that's not for me to say publicly. That's between their ministry and that's between that prophet or prophetess and, and, and uh, the Lord God. So mine is to esteem others more highly than myself. Figs that suffer from root knot, and I'll read this, and this is interesting, N-E-M-A-T-O-D-E-S. 
I don't even know how to, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even going to take a shot at that one. Uh, not whatever that word is, uh, may also have trouble uh, fruiting correctly. And if you think of that is where is the root of our knowledge and understanding of the Lord Jesus and has to be rooted in scripture. And it has to be rooted in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the Father draws us, you know, the Spirit draws us to the Father, and, and we get to the Father through Jesus Christ. So if we have a deep root system, we are grounded in the Word, and we have a personal relationship with Jesus. So there are other several environmental factors can also affect when a fruit tree produces fruit. A fruit drop, in some cases, a young, healthy fig tree undergoes proper pollination and fruit set, then drops all of its fruit suddenly. Uh, this phenomenon is usually caused by overfeeding. So you read the symbolism in, into that. Uh, stop fertilizing uh, the plant immediately. It may take three or four years for the fig to recover from over fertilization and produce a crop that ripens and stays on the tree. So it says that you can do everything right. And yet uh, this particular tree, it may, when it's young, it can just drop all the leaves suddenly. And we have, sadly, a, a table full of um, a lot of mothers and grandmothers and, and a few great grandmothers and, and, and some men that have asked us to pray for children that were raised in the Lord or taught in the Lord and then suddenly just departed from those ways. And it just, it breaks our heart. We, we pray with him in agreement uh, that the, uh, the Lord would do a, a, a new thing in their life and turn them back. Also, and I have a picture, but I won't show this. And without bees, uh, pollination may not occur even for self-pollinating flowers. So fig trees can self-pollinate, but it is helped uh, with the presence of, of bees. I want to show you a picture and then, then read this to you. And it's interesting. It is you can see the green and the red of this big tree. And I'll read this to you. So the purple figs are ripe, while the green and red ones are not quite ready. So you look at a fig tree and then look at the uh, analogy. A poor man's offering, and this is from a rabbinical, a rabbi friend, their offering was unleavened bread for a poor man's offering in, in those days, also known as the poor man's bread. He was flat and simple, a most, hum a most humble offering, also a branch of fig leaves for the poorest. So if they didn't have bread, and even a, a dove, uh, they could bring a branch of fig leaves uh, for the poorest and, and offer that, and it was accepted by the Lord. Leviticus uh, 1.14, if you want to write this down, and if his sacrifice to God is a burnt offering from birds, he shall bring it from turtle doves or from young doves. So that's uh, for the poor that they were able to offer doves and for others it was the poor man's bread and then for the poorest they could just bring a branch of fig leaves so i wanted to cover that with you and i got like i said all my notes everywhere um i want to show this to you is i've seen and i'll try to word this delicately Dinosaur. This is hiding in the fig leaves. This is the size of today's fig leaves. I want to relay something to you. Uh, this dinosaur, by the way, was found in Argentina. It's uh, so new it, it it doesn't have an official name. They call it the Argentinosaurus. Its length was 131 feet and his weight was 110 tons. The astounding 70-foot height of the Argentinosaurus 
would compete with that of a seven story building, rendering it untouchable as it grazed for hours on plant matter. Think of a seven story building and, and about the weight of a seven story building is the size of this. And I'll read this uh, Genesis 3, 7 it says the eyes of the two of them were opened. That is their awareness was increased talking about Adam and Eve. And they knew that they were naked and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And I'll read this real quick about fig leaves and covering. This is again from the rabbi. In the Hebrew language, a fig leaf is an excuse. So you're trying to cover something is what they're say, saying. Excuses try and cover and do not work all that well. As in the case of Adam and Eve, they were trying to cover it, but God knew what they had done and, and where they were. When he said, where are you? He knew where they were. He wanted to see the response. Uh, fig leaves today are not sufficient to cover the less honorable parts of our body. And uh, you, know, you can look uh, in the New Testament, the word, and it talks about the unseemly parts or the, the unmodest parts that, that we pay special attention to, but I didn't want to get in that today. Um, what I did, I was on a previous program as a co-host, and it was talking about the supernatural, and it was talking uh, with uh, select guests that there were a few that I thought were really legitimate. Others, I don't know about, um, that had been to heaven, and it was interesting, uh, a lady and I, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful she sent me a note and suggested a book on heaven if I wanted to learn about heaven. And I guess she didn't know and had never watched that other show. Um, when the Lord was taking me through the structures of heaven and the angelic and, and those that uh, in, in the different spheres of the choirs of, of the angelic, the Jews look at it one way, the Jewish people, uh, and then I... Uh, detailed it out what the Lord had taken me to heaven. And I've been there many, well, a lot of times, put it that way. Everything in heaven, and I had mentioned on, on that show a few times, uh, even the flowers were the size of, and I have in, in the uh, prayer room, is a lar large round table that we, we have the prayer request on. Uh, the flowers were that size. They were large, large. And when I had seen grapes, they, um, the grapes were the, the, the size of a cantaloupe. And I, I believe I have it, but in, in with numbers, and, and I'll read that so that you'll understand. Um, let me do that now. Go to numbers 13, 21 through 24. And I'm trying to give you an idea of what heaven ha is like, but also what uh, the Garden of Eden would have been like at that time. And even uh, at the time of dinosaurs, uh, the size of plants and, and the size uh, of these um, creatures, seven foot, foot building, there were 10 uh, in a, some list that were just tremendous size and uh, voracious in their appetite. And it also is part of <laughs> where <laughs> My friend, <laughs> Nephilim, in uh, the study that I did with the uh, watchers when they came down and the giants, the, the Nephilim. But Numbers 13 is, so they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness to Zen, uh, from Zen, uh, to Rehob, R-E-H-O-B, a town in Lebanon, uh, far west, far north corner of Lebanon. When they had gone up into the Negev, the, the south country, they came to Hebron, and it, it goes on, but this was uh, the the descendants of Anak. Um, then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and that is interesting, because that valley of Eshcol it is uh, it means actually in the Hebrew a cluster of grapes. So they came to uh, the valley of the cluster of grapes, and from there they cut down a branch with a single I understand a single cluster of grapes. And they carried on a pole between two of them. So it took two men, uh, the, you know, the, the young and, and best of each uh, of the different tribes that went out, the 12 spies uh, with, with Caleb and Joshua. 
And it took two of them to carry these grapes back because they were so large and they were grown in the area where these giants were, the Anak and the, the Melekites earlier in, in, in the scripture, Old Testament, is where Joshua had to fight these Amalekites. And I believe I had mentioned one time about him praying and asking for another half a day of daylight to continue killing uh, the Amalekites as they, as they fled. Uh, Numbers, uh, same chapter, 13, verse 28. But the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified. In other words, they were walled and very large. Moreover, we saw there the descendants of Anak, and that is people of great stature and courage. So when they brought those out, these were the size of, of cantaloupes. The grapes were, and as I said, the flowers were the size of, of a round table. And I tell you that because when you look at these and Adam and Eve, were they sewed these things together, um, so as they fastened leaves together, they were large leaves. They weren't little like this hand size one. They were very lar large leaves at the time. So to let you know that in heaven, things are, you really can't describe it. Not the colors, not the sound. Um, I know in some of those shows, I, I talked about uh, some of the various things that I had seen um, and I'll, maybe I'll be able to do that in the future. So let me also talking about heaven. I, I want to show you one other thing that is interesting. And, and this is just kind of the part of the study. Go to Acts 7, 54, and I'm going to read 54 through 58. And this is when Stephen is stoned to death. And I, and I want to mention about portals, uh, wormholes, some call them gateways. And you, there's a lot of movies on, on that. And especially, uh, you know, after I talked about that group and, you know, the all thing, they, they're more familiar with that than most Christians are. So in Acts, when they heard these things, they were overtaken with violent rage, filling their souls and they gnashed their teeth. So they were, you know, read that about Stephen. But Stephen, overtaken with great faith, was full of the Holy Spirit. He fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm and saw the glory and splendor of God in Jesus, who stood up at the right hand of God. So he's on earth in this dimension. And when they're about to stone him, he's able to see directly in, into heaven through portals, through gateways, through whatever you want to call it. It was the same way with Adam and Eve in the garden before they fell, that they could look directly into heaven and see heaven, and heaven could look directly into the Garden of Eden. And the Lord would come down in the afternoon and walk with him every afternoon. So what it was then before the curse that the Lord opened up the heavens and like I said, you can call it, and I'll show you a picture in just a second. And this is what Stephen said, and it enraged them. Um, Look, Stephen said, I can see the heavens opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God to welcome me home, quoting him. <laughs> I will, this part, it says, Jesus sits at the, the Passion. Jesus sits at the right hand of God, but when he he saw Stephen give his last breath for the gospel. He stood to welcome his martyr into his eternal reward. So Stephen was able to look directly and see, you know, we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the father. And it says, in this case, Stephen saw him stand to welcome him. <laughs> this is how happy it made his, it, the Jewish people. His accu accusers covered their ears with their hands and screamed at the top of their lungs to drown out his voice. Then they pounced on him and threw him outside the city walls to stone him. His accusers one by one placed their outer garments at the feet of a young man, a Pharisee by the name of Saul of Tarsus. We know about Saul of Tarsus. So in that, in this dimension, Book of Acts, 
Stephen, when he got the Jews so excited over his revelation and insight into the heaven, the Lord stood up to welcome his martyr home. And he's, he's there for all of us. When it's our time, we will be embraced by the Lord himself. And all of heaven awaits it uh, for that day. And many relatives and uh, their animals in heaven, you know, as you have here, uh, there are animals, there are dogs and other things in, in heaven. So that is on Stephen. And I'm slowly going through the process of what the Lord teaches me. So in 2005, for an anticipated third temple, this is from a uh, interview with a member of the Sanhedrin in February of 2020, and I'll read this. Different fig trees and, and other trees. Five years ago in 2015, Sanhedrin began planning and preparation for the needs of the third temple. Today is the first day the fruit of the labor can be used. And this is in February uh, last year, 2020. Along with animal sacrifices, plants played a significant role at the altar of sacrifice. Examples or wine libations, L-I-B-A-T-I-O-N-S, came from vines cultivated adhering to the Torah. Grain offerings were necessary elements in the daily temple service and large quantities of the highest quality olive oil were used in the menorah. Even the wood burned on the altar was harvested, especially for temple use, and individually checked for worms. Ever present on the altar were three piles of wood, the first for the burning uh, the animal sacrifices, the second for making coals to burn the incense, and the third for the perpetual altar fire commanded by God. And I will show this to you and read these to you. We're talking about the altar fire. This is just a rendition of Herod's temple. If you see, this is the altar for sacrifice. This is the raisin for water that had 12 bulls holding it up. So this is the altar, brazen altar. Leviticus 6.5 and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the Kohen, K-O-H-E-N, shall burn wood on it every morning. And I'll speak a little bit of that in just a second. The wood used in these arrangements were considered sacrifices. In the second temple, the wood was provided as an annual offering. So even the, the wood was considered an offering by those that brought it. If you look at Nehemiah 10.35, it says that, and we cast lots, the Conan, C-O-H-A-N-I-M. These were the priests who were direct descendants of Aaron. And the, <laughs> I will spell it, L-E-V-I-I-M. I know it's from the, the tribe of Levi, the Levites. It says the tribe of Levi was not direct uh, descendants of Aaron. They were uh, musicians and, and singers uh, there at the temple site, and, and they accompanied the Kohen uh, in, in, in helping with sacrifices. So it says that not only were the Kohen and, and the Levites, but also and the people for the wood, wood offering to bring it into the house of God. So it says, you know, they considered that to be an offering unto God. And it's a key point in, in, in just a second. So that's on that piece. Let's see where I got all this. This is the trees that they're planted in from 2005 on. The other, let me mention this so I, I can. Um, the olive tree can never be used on, on the altar. So the difference between the olive tree and the fig tree that's why the fig tree, when I get to the parable in just a minute, is important that the olive tree with producing olive oil from the menorah, uh, the 
I guess we would call it extra virgin olive oil today or even better, um, that it can never uh, be used on the altar. The preferred wood was the fig tree, pomegranate and grapevines are the preferred wood. So on that one, on the olive tree, let me cover this one. As I said, the olive tree can never be used on the altar. Uh, we now fig tree, pomegranate, and grapevines. The beauty and size of this tree, the one I showed you, is special. And quoting this A-B-U-A-L-I, he's a Palestinian. Uh, he says, it's the most beautiful tree in Palestine. And he, every day before sunrise, goes out and takes care of this tree, and then sunset comes back home. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Agriculture, the tree is estimated to be around 5,000 years old. From their experience of farming, Palestinians know that the older the tree, the better the quality and the taste of olives and the oil they produce. So they can never be used on the altar, but figs can, uh, and even old grapevines. So covering that and moving tw towards what and this is the way he teaches me. So I wanted to cover this and then show you a uh, map and, and a PowerPoint also. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that's, uh, we'll read that in explaining the parable in just a minute. Mark 11, 1. And I'll go back through these in just a minute. Now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at the place of the stables. And this was uh, near Bethany on the Mount of Olives. So I wanted you to know that when he left uh, to go to Jerusalem, and this is when he uh, entered into Jerusalem on, on the fold of a donkey, fold of a colt, that um, this was during the summer time when it would be the first harvest of the fig tree not the second in, in the winter time. And we'll look at those dates in just a minute and I'll show you a calendar of it. So I wanted you to know, and I'll cover that a little bit more that when he left the Mount of Olives near Bethany, that he uh, went to Jerusalem and, and there is when he made his entry. Um, Bethpage, B-E-T-H-P-H-A-G-E, -E, which in Aramaic means the house of stables. So that's what um, the place of stables, it, the house of stables. But the transliterated into Greek is interesting. It means in Greek, which would be New Testament, the house of unripe figs. It's interesting how you have to go deeper into the word and deeper into studying. I've studied Hebrew, Chaldean, Greek, um, Latin, a lot of for years, um, but I can't get any English very good. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We'll cover this in just a, a minute. Luke 19, 29, and I hope you've taken notes. It happened when they drew near to Bethpage in Bethany at the mountain that is called Olivet. So he sent two disciples from the Mount of Olivet, Mount of Olives, which should be interesting in a minute. I'll tell you about that. Uh, Chapter 21, verse 37. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olives, Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. I want you to understand a Sabbath day's journey. And I have it somewhere. <laughs> um, Acts 1, 12, then they returned, and there is a Sabbath day's journey. This is so I could understand it. A Sabbath day journey was a unit of distance equal to about 0.598 uh, of a mile. And if I couldn't understand that, but if, you know, being shown, I could understand a football field and then tell me, uh, you know, son, this is the distance that you can walk on a, on a Sabbath is about 10 football fields. Then I have a pretty good idea of, of the distance. Uh, that, that's the Jewish leaders limited people to journey on the Sabbath 
in any direction in the wilds outside their city limits. So the Jewish leader is the Sanhedrin in, in Jerusalem is called the Great Sanhedrin. And in smaller cities, it's called the Sanhedrin, the small Sanhedrin, deeming the journey to be work if you went any further than that. Uh, Acts 112 isn't saying that the apostles respected this man-made law because they were criticized every time they did something, even when they were taking uh, the, the head off of wheat, they said they were harvesting, but simply indicating the distance between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. I wanted you to know that between the Mount of Olives and Jerusalem is about 10 football fields. Um, now, this is interesting to we'll cover Jesus's entry into, into um, Jerusalem. I want you to see this, and that's the map of it. These are the first fruit. That first fruit that is not very good, poor man's fruit, the entry into Jerusalem. And we'll cover that in a minute. As I said, this is about 10 football fields from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. So it was on the way from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem that he came across this fig tree, is the point I want you to understand. It was near the Mount of Olives. And I'm, uh, if you can see this or not. I've uh, looked at different messianic rabbis. I've looked at rabbis to see you know, how they think about uh, Jesus and they don't think very much about him. They don't accept him. And that's why I said last week, uh, many of the Jewish leaders cannot accept America as a covenant nation, because if they do, then they have to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Well, those uh, rabbis, they're messianic, uh, Nicodemus, uh, Joseph of, of Arimathea, and some like that. But in a 1996 article in Biblical Horizons, if you want to Google that, Biblical Horizons, and his name is James Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, makes several, excuse me, several observations about the Mount of Olives and its significance both in Jesus's ministry and in biblical theology in general. This is interesting what he says. There, Jordan argues that Jesus was likely crucified on the Mount of Olives. And you can see his essay at that particular um, URL, Biblical Horizons. One of the rabbis that I study and, and, and follow, he firmly believes that Jesus was crucified on uh, the Mount of Olives and refers uh, me or others to, to this particular uh, essay. And then they have a, a lot of their own writings, but I didn't want to get too much into that. So that is the distance between the Mount of Olives and uh, Jerusalem. And like I said, the significance of the Mount of Olives really can't be overstated. I know the, you know, the, the Mount of the Skull is, is and, and the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea Many believe, Messianic rabbis and others, that he was crucified on the Mount of Olives. So I showed you that entry in, into Jerusalem. And so we'll start getting in, into uh, the relevance of that uh, as I read this. Mark 11, 1 through 3, and I'll cover that in just a minute in, in more detail. But I did want to show you... Um, some maps, but let me go ahead and do that one now. Mark 11, 1 through 3. We're, uh, this is Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived at the place of the stables. As I said, the house of stables are uh, unripe figs. It was at the foot of Mount Olives near Bethany on the Mount of Olives. So Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead and said to them, as soon as you enter the village, you will find a donkey's colt tied there 
that has never been written. Untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks why you're taking it, tell them the master needs it and will send it back to you soon. It's interesting in, in the New Testament that, and I, and I look through it, that there was never a time when Jesus needed anything. But this is the first mention in the Gospels or even in the New Testament that he needed something they didn't have. He needed a donkey. And so he sent two of his disciples. And sure enough, they were asked and they said, the master needs it. And so it was it was taken care of. So he. That's um, Mark 11, 1. And I want to show you because this is relevant and this is a deeper understanding than like I said, a, a little sermon. So I'm going to, excuse me, maybe you can see that. Seven feasts of the, of the Lord. And, and this one is a, just a different shot of it. Why is this important? And, you, and you'll see. Leviticus 23, 4 through 5. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Passover is celebrated in, in the first month of the Jewish calendar in the month of Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, on the 14th day of the month. N-I-S-A-N, Nisan 14, is the anniversary the day of the memorial of the day when Jesus Christ died. At that time when Jesus Christ was on earth, the day started in Israel after sundown till the next day at sundown. For us, that, that's April the 15th, 5782 in 2020, this coming year. So they're divided into, the feasts are divided, as, as you saw, into the spring feast, which are these, which is when he went into the city, and then the autumn feast, which we recently just went through. So he is crucified at Passover during the month of Nisan, the 14th, and you Exodus 12, and then Matthew 26, 17 through 27. Why is it important? For the feast. I've covered Mark 11, 1. And I'll, two more in Mark, and then I'll go into more detail with Matthew. Why is it important? Is when Jesus went into the uh, city, is when he made his entry in, in, into, and that's a whole uh, thing that is interesting, very interesting of what happened. Uh, but Maybe there's another time I can share that. It's very interesting. Um, that was the time of the first fruits for the fig tree. And he's leaving the Mount of Olives and going to Jerusalem to prepare to do that. And then he comes back that night to the mountain. So I'm going to pick it up at Mark 11, 12 through 14, Mark 11, 28 through 30. Uh, for two different scriptures and then go into more detail in Matthew and then try to wrap this up. Mark 11, 12 through 14. The next day as he left Bethany, Jesus was feeling hungry. It's also the only time in, in the Bible where I find that the son of God was hungry. And so we know that he was hungry. We know that he wept over uh, Jerusalem, we know that he was moved with Martha and Mary at the gravesite of Lazarus. So he was, he's an incredible person. He's, he, he's a person. He, he's a man, but he's also God. But the way he knew his disciples and called them friends and Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha and so many others, uh, Peter you know, and his mo mother-in-law and, and his wife, He's an incredible person, and he has a sense of humor, and he loves to laugh. I think he's a practical joker myself, but people may make it of what you want. 
So he noticed a, a leafy fig tree in the distance. So he walked over to see if there was any fruit on it, but there was none. Remember, this is the early summertime. Only leaves, for it wasn't yet the season for bearing figs. Well, if reading and studying on, on figs, if they produce leaves at the same time, they also produce the fruit. So if you see the leaves, you can make a guess that it has fruit on it. And so he went over to it and saw that there was no fruit. Jesus spoke to the fig tree saying, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples overheard him. I'll cover that again in a minute. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. From the fig tree, learn his lessons. And this is him talking to his disciples. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer is near, spring, and they're going into summer. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he, talking about Jesus, is near, even at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, and I'll give you a description of the generation. But I want to get into more detail with this because this is what he told me that night when he was going through this. So we'll start on it and I'll try to finish out on this one. These signs of the times. And it, it came from that prophecy before that he gave to me of the green bottle. And he wanted to get into more detail of what we're experiencing today because so many people are distraught. And, and I understand that. Uh, discouraged. They feel overwhelmed. Um, we, we know what this administration is doing. Uh, and we talked about the seven months and when the restoration of August 20th would begin. Um, uh, I've talked about Humpty Dumpty and I talked about uh, Medusa uh, from the visions and prophetic word the Lord had given to me. All the things that happened with this uh, particular virus, I uh, have shared that with you as well, uh, of, of what they're trying to do and what they're trying to accomplish. And you should look at, and we'll talk about that in just a second, uh, the age of Aquarius. Is there utopian time uh, that they think they're going to live in bliss and nothing to do with Jesus? This is time for the one world government. If you would uh, turn to Matthew 24, one through two, or just write down the scriptures and I'll go through these. As Jesus was leaving the temple courts, his disciples came to him and pointed out the beautiful architecture of the temple. And Jesus turned to them and said, take a good look at all these things. For I'm telling you, there will not be one stone left upon another. It will be leveled. Remember that is what they tried to use on him. Uh, in the interrogation that the high priest put him through, uh, but their witnesses wouldn't stand up. This prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled by the Roman uh, Prince Titus, who in uh, the Roman War, A.D. 67 and 70, destroyed the temple. And about A.D. 135, Emperor, and I'll spell his name, H-A-D-R-I-A-N, uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and built a new city on its foundation and named it, and I'll spell this, A-E-L-I-A, -A, the second word, C-A-P-I-T-O-L-I-N-A, -A, Capitolina, Alia Capitolina, which is just part of history. I have a history buff. The Lord knows that, so he shares, shares those things with me. Uh, verse 3, Matthew 24, later when they arrived at the Mount of Olives, they came back, his disciples came privately to where he was sitting and said, tell us, when will these things happen? And what sign should we expect to signal they knew you're coming and the completion of this age? So they knew when he was talking, he was talking about himself. And uh, as far as the age, and I'll say, although it is possible to translate this, the end of the world, the Hebraic mindset of the end of days is a translation, get this one now, into a new age of the Messiah's coming when all things will be restored. That counterfeit, remember I told you, you take something that's good and counterfeit it for evil. So now they call it the new age of Aquarius. When in the Hebrew mindset, when he was talking 2000 years ago, they understood that there was a new age of Jesus uh, coming when all things would be restored. 
And so again, the counterfeit, look at him, he'll forge things and he'll counterfeit everything for evil to fit his own trying to glorify himself. The age of Aquarius that I had talked about last time, it is a, Jesus said, it's a false religion, uh, one world order, financial, uh, this is currency, and they want a one world currency. In fact, they would like to do away with uh, the paper and, and coin altogether. Uh, actually, they'd like it to be implanted, and you can do it that way along with your, and I'll get into that. Corporations, and we see that right now with supply chain problems, and we've been praying for that for the last month, as he has shown me. Uh, food chain and also employment with these corporations. Uh, they are now saying, uh, if you do not have, uh, if you have not followed a particular mandate by the government, then your employment may be terminated. And we know that, um, and I know Luke loves the NFL. Uh, I, I don't watch the NBA. I don't watch baseball after their second strike. Uh, I, you know, those that do, that, that's great. I, I'm not judging that. I just don't. Um, but. NFL and in NBA and, and uh, they've gone the woke way for quite a while and trying to lead that, making players uh, to follow this mandate. And if they don't, then they won't be able to play. Uh, healthcare is the same way with medical personnel and their facilities that they're telling them, if you do not adhere to this mandate, that you'll be terminated. And facilities are accommodating the same thing um, uh, you know, recently I've had to go through several specialists and e each one of them asked me if, if I've followed this particular mandate. That's my personal part. Travel, transportation systems, your passport. So even the airlines um, woke that they're considering and, and looking to, to appease this particular administration that they will not allow you to travel, first of all, outside the country with passport, but the other is they're, they're trying to restrict it even further. And of course, religion. There are many uh, in the religious community that are promoting this and uh, adhering to it and encouraging their members to adhere to that. So that's, you have to make a decision. The all-seeing eye will do away with the Declaration of Independence, which the Lord showed in the, the Green Bottle, the Bill of Rights, uh, freedom of speech, and the First Amendment, Second Amendment, the, the right to bear arms. This is their whole agenda in moving towards the age of Aquarius. So that's Matthew, verse 3, 24, verse 4 and 5, when they ask him what can we expect? And I want you to think about what we're seeing today. Jesus answered at that time, deception will run rampant. So be aware that you are not fooled for many will appear on the scene, claiming my authority or saying about themselves. I am the anointed one and they will not possibly, they will lead many astray. Claiming my authority saying about themselves, they are the anointed. I guess you may be cautious to those that promote themselves rather than Jesus Christ. And I pray almost every day that, Lord, whatever we do, may it be to glorify you and honor you, Lord. Verse 6, you will hear wars and revolutions on every side with more rumors of war to come. I'll get into that a little bit better. Don't panic or give into your fears for the breaking apart of the world system is destined to happen, but it won't yet be the end. It will still be unfolding. When he told me that he's preparing to meet his bride and many of the disciples and the apostle Paul 2000 years ago, they were anticipating his return at any time. So I believe if we say that we're at the end time, just abbreviated version without going into the details and, and background of it, that we are in the end times and he is preparing. 
does that mean next week or does that mean 10 years from now? In part two, I'll get in, into more of that. But that's, that's not the mentality that we should have of leaving. We should occupy. That's the difficulty I had in the uh, charismatic movement is they had the mentality of leaving and we didn't occupy. We didn't keep our ground and we gave it up. I realized the Lord wasn't coming and we real we look around and see every, they call it the seven mountains, every area that we have given up territory over to the evil one. Matthew 24, seven and eight. This is interesting. Nations. I want you to understand the actual context of the word nations, but you have to break it down. That word nations is ethnic group. So ethnic group will go to war against ethnic group and kingdoms against kingdoms. That's nation against nation. But the other is ethnic groups. So think of the division that they're trying to, through Saul Alinsky, uh, the rules for radicals of what they're doing to try and divide the different um, ethnic groups in, in the United States and as well around the world. We know those that follow the Quran, um, their feeling about those that do not follow their Islam and what they're directed to do out of uh, the Quran. Uh, so you say, well, it's not a harmless religion. If you go in and read that and, and look at the particular scriptures, I have. Uh, to study those types of things without talking, you know, without knowledge or understanding. They tell their followers what they must do to those that do not adhere to their religion. So ethnic group will go to war against ethnic group and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there will be terrible earthquakes, mention that, epidemics, we're seeing that, and famines in place after place. That's one of the desires they have in the supply chain and, and people unable to <clears throat> fulfill their job or employment because they're being terminated or threatened to be terminated. And <clears throat> excuse me, Luke told me last night that AT&T has given their employees until February of 2022 to adhere to that or their jobs will be terminated. This is how the birth pains of a new age will begin. Not the age of Aquarius, the age of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's a distorted use of the world new age. True believers in Christ anticipate the coming of a new day or age dawning with Christ and his bride ruling the nations. Joel 2 and Revelations 3, 21. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 9 through 14, you can expect to be persecuted, even killed, for you'll be hated by all the nations because of your love for me. Then many will stop following me and fall away because they'll fall away as a, actually the Greek is stumble or take offense. And they will betray one another and hate one another. This is talking about Christians. This is not talking about those that are unsaved. This is, they will stop following me. So they were part of us. And then they left because they were, uh, they took offense or, or they stumbled and they cared more for the things of the world than the things of the kingdom. <clears throat> Verse 11, and many lying prophets will arise, deceiving multitudes and leading them away from the path of truth. There will, excuse me, there'll be such an increase of the sin of lawlessness that those who hearts once burned with passion for God and others will grow cold. But hold your hope, endure firmly to the end, and you will experience life and deliverance. Yet through it all, the good news of heaven's kingdom will be proclaimed all over the world, providing every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. And after that, the end of this age will arrive. So there's the hope that we have that even in the midst of what they're trying to do, God has said through his son, Jesus Christ, the father said of his son, that the kingdom 
of heaven will be proclaimed all over the world, every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. This is scripture. So I'm not saying this of my own. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this in particular. This is the detestable idol that brings misery. Like I said, I'll elaborate on this another time. Matthew 24, 15 through 22 was that one. <clears throat> I will go through, instead of breaking it out to next time, these, this one, and then I will go into the parable of the fig tree the next time. I believe I'm at about an hour. So skipping down to verse 24, Matthew 24, 23 through 28. And you will hear reports from some saying, look, he has returned. The Messiah is over here or the Messiah is over there. Don't believe it. For there will be imposters falsely claiming to be God's anointed one. And again, false prophets. The Aramaic is prophet of lies will arise to perform miracle sign, miraculous signs and lead astray if possible, those God has chosen to be his. Remember this, for our prophesy will happen. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, telling them, I'm prophesying, this is what's going to happen. So if someone says to you, look, the anointed one has returned. He is in the desert. Don't go chasing after him or her. Or if they say to you, look, he's here in our house or her. Uh, that is, the house is the inner rooms uh, of a house, the very inner rooms of, of a uh, church. Don't believe it. The appearing or the presence, uh, and that is the word P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A -A in the Greek. Uh, presence is that word, parazusa. I don't I, <laughs> No way. Oh, the Son of Man will burst forth with the brightness of lightning shining from the eastern sky to the west. How do birds of prey know where the dead body is? Or whenever you find the corpse, there the eagles will gather. This particular verse is best understood as a parallel of vultures, knowing where the carcass is, for example, to know how instinctively believers will know when Jesus has appeared. So he's saying that instinctively, the same way that vultures know where there's a, a, a dead carcass is my followers, my true followers will know when it's my appearance is coming. They won't be deceived. And I'm sad to know that so many will be deceived by false prophets that arise. And it says that they'll actually perform miracles and signs and wonders, uh, which is sad. The appearing of the Son of Man is I will go through this and then finish out today and take up part two uh, on Thursday, if the Lord wills. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Then immediately, this is what will take place. The sun will be darkened and the moon give no light. The stars will fall from the sky and all the cosmic powers will be shaken. I want you to see and understand this part uh, about the stars will fall from the sky and the cosmic powers. I want you to look at Isaiah 13, 10, 34, 4, Joel 2, 10, and Amos 8, 9. Isaiah 13, 10, 34, 4, Joel 2, 10, and Amos 8 and 9. This can also be viewed as a Hebraic metaphor of the lights of the natural realm being shut off and replaced with heavenly glory. Lights out on the old order. Sun, moon, and stars are also representative of the governmental structures failing with great calamity. A new order, a new glory is coming to replace the fading glories of this world. So when you look at Matthew 24, 29 through 31, uh, look at and understand that the, the lights and uh, cosmic powers the stars are talking about representative of governmental structures failing uh, with great calamity. <clears throat> then the sign announcing the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn over him. Uh, Zechariah 12, 
10 through 14, Revelation 1, 7. And they will see the Son of Man appearing in the clouds of heaven, re revealed with mighty power. The Hebrew in this, uh, Matthew, the background of him, is mighty warriors with great splendor and glory. Now, there will be mighty warriors with splendor and glory appearing with him. And he will send his messengers with a loud blast of the trumpet, the shofar. There's always a deeper meaning to the literal understanding of the text of the Bible. The deeper meaning does not negate the literal, but gives a fuller comprehension. So I'm trying to give you a little more information. Clouds are metaphors of God's presence among his people. The trumpet, the shofar blast is a universal announcement that will be heard by all. And with a great voice, that word voice is shout, they will gather his beloved chosen ones from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. That's the end of Matthew 24, 29 through 31. What I will cover the next time, if you want to read this, is he is going to explain the parable of the fig tree. And when he gave me the parable of the fig tree, he took me back and went through this entire lesson of what is symbolic of the fig tree, the truth of the fig tree as we know it uh, in, in the natural, and when they produce fruit, when they produce the late fruit, when they uh, are juveniles, they don't produce much fruit, but when they're adults, they do. Um, that how special the olive tree is, and we know that that feeds in, into the menorah uh, in the holy place, not the holy of holies, but in the holy place, uh, that special oil, and that is also the lighting of the menorah uh, celebration of the lights when that one uh, light continued to burn for eight days while they were trying to produce new oil to, to put it in, but that's a, another one. But I will talk about the parable of the fig tree, uh, get into why he said that no one will gather fruit from you again, and then get into what he closed out with me was the uh, there's still that time that's remaining. And I have one more slide on, on that. Um, span of time is the wall and revival and the bride without spot and wrinkle. So he is coming back for a bride. That is not the way we are right now. There's correction. There's um, discipline uh, coming so that we are uh, walking in victory rather than the way a lot seem to today. Millennial reign, and this is when he's coming. This part two is the thousand year reign and judgment of the beast, the false prophet and the antichrist. I won't delve in, into those other than knowing that these people that believe the age of Aquarius is going to, they're going to find out that who's actually in control. And, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. All things are within him. It says that all things were created by him in him and for him because the father gave him all the authority. So I will talk about that. And, uh, the new heavens and new earth from Isaiah uh, 65, if you want to look at that 17, and then Isaiah 66, 22 through 23 is where um, the new earth, new heavens, and new earth. So that will be for this Thursday, if the Lord wills. Um, let me thank our, our Father and, and Jesus for this time and then close out. Father, I, I, I thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your compassion. But, you know, for Jesus, he is everything to us. He is, he painted a picture. Um, he weaved a tapestry of, of, of you when he was here, filled with compassion and mercies. And he's the same yesterday and today, and he'll always be that way. So I pray that you would touch your people, those that are crying out to you, Lord. Uh, you, you placed on my heart uh, this week, the wisdom warriors and, and, and those that are senior citizens that 
Um, these are trying times, Lord. And I just pray not only for them financially, but I pray for them health-wise. And, and so many, Lord, that are taking care of uh, elders and, and had to give up their jobs and, and spend time. And uh, it's a, sometimes it can be discouraging. And so I, I pray for them, Lord. Farmers and, and ranchers. And, Lord, we need you as your ecclesia, your ecclesia the remnant, but the great eagle needs you. And, and I intercede for them every day, this nation, and I pray for them and I call out to you. And, and you've told me that I have a voice with you because you've called me to it. And so I, I use that to pray for this nation, and I pray for the people. And I, I pray that you would change things that are evil and bring justice where there has been no justice, Lord. Uh, and, and let us see it quickly, Lord. Do this work quickly. We love you. We honor you. And we praise you through Jesus. Thank you again. It's, as I said, it's, it's always an honor. And, and I value your time. I ask that the Lord bless each of you. Bless your families. And may our God, may our one God that we trust in, uh, those that are, are American patriots and those that love Jesus Christ, uh, may he bless the United States of America and our veterans and our law enforcement. Lord, they, they need your hand upon them. So thank you again, and I'll see you the next time.